Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the workers uh, group exchange this morning. People are coming into the system uh, so now. We have about uh, 35 uh, people so far. Um, um, we have over 400 people who signed up for the SIRP, for the workers group, but they will not, the, the total number of registrants, I saw somebody react, the total number of registrants never uh, uh, attend. Um, so uh, again, we welcome you to this morning's effort. We do uh, appreciate your uh, participation. And so we will uh, begin with someone who has struggled to get out of bed to join us this morning, even though he has COVID. So we will start with him and maybe if he cannot stay until a brief Q&A at the end, then we will appreciate his being with us uh, as long as he can. So I'll turn the mic over to, uh, and I didn't introduce myself. My name is Dee, I work with the Air Commission and I'm very happy to participate in this uh, activity. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I'll turn the mic over to Perry now. Hey comrades, uh, happy Black History Month. Uh, and thanks, thanks to you for the intro. Um, Y'all are all the most people I've talked to in two days. It's true, after four years, it finally got me. I'm COVID positive, COVID no more. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna read a quick, uh, a quick short story if, if my voice can handle it. Um, it was nominated for a best microfiction award of this year, um, but as of yesterday, I find out I found out that I didn't win. So this is my my small celebration anyway, getting to read it with all of y'all. Um, a quick two seconds about me: I live in West Philadelphia. I work as a public librarian, and I'm um, the chief steward at Ask Me District Council 47. Um, and I also write fiction in my spare time. Um, so I'm going to read a, a little a little microfiction story for you. Um, about three minutes long. It was published in California's journal, The Disappointed Housewife. Um, and then I'll pass it back to Dee um, and hopefully survive if I don't succumb to my illness. Okay. Um, thanks again for y'all being here. Happy Black History Month. Um, Avery and Jacob. Fifth. So Avery plays the Serenelli, her shoulders bobbing, floating around the living room hovering over the couch and the TV, up over the roofs of the terraced houses, through the schoolyard, soaring, fluttering down the slide and between swing set chains, through the tire in the backyard, and then back in. Another tooth pops from the accordion and bounces onto the carpet. Jacob chokes. Fourth. Avery springs up and walks to the boxy television where the accordion rests. She hoists it over her shoulder, sagging under its weight. She taps brass buttons and plays, clicking a shanty with her loafers. Eliza Lee, but the accordion has problems keeping up. It's an old snake. She can't charm the accordion much longer, and like Jacob, it's getting older, grayer. Last week, a single plastic key fell on the carpet and she bent for it. She'd sized it with her mouth, holding it between her lips. Jacob had been stretched on the couch, his fuzzy socks resting on the arm, and the saddest look in the world spread over his face. He knew he had to explain it to her now. Third. Jacob scrapes streaks with his butter knife into rye toasts. He unplugs his toaster, and while gray cold fills the orange coils, the toast zips off the paper towel. Plate under that, he says. You'll crumb everywhere, please. You lied, she says, lips glistening. I found a gray hair trailing down my hand. Is that why you were in the doghouse, he says. Her crunches pitch. No, she says. One of them saw me. His forehead wrinkles untense. That was most certainly the dog's fur, not yours. He dabs her lips with the paper towel while she eyes his knuckles suspiciously. Now, he says, would you like more toast? Second. They walk around a tractor tire half submerged in the dirt. 
the gray shaggy terrier whimpers outside. In his living room, an accordion, a Serenelli Casotto droops on top of a snowy television. And first. Avery had torn a trail through the wet leaves, hunching in the doghouse corner. Avery, Jacob says, are you mad at me today? Yes, she says into her sweater's neck. Ah, he says. I'm not telling you why, she says. Feels like everyone's mad at me today, says Jacob. His head draws back and his red pinstripe paunch folds in like a pocket knife. He grunts, his arm reaching toward her. Come, he says. Breakfast. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Perry. Can you describe for us again? Well, we don't want to uh, push you, but if you can tell us again, you you uh, categorized that. You called it micro what? Microfiction. It's only 350 words. So uh, microfiction, one would say, is 500 words or less. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Perry. If you want to uh, go and rest, we understand. If in before you actually do rest, if you could reach out to Karamo and get him here, we would appreciate that. But if not, if you, we we set, we salute you for being here under the uh, challenges of COVID. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll try my best, but comrades, don't take it personally if I fall off. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Perry. All right, so we'd like to move now to Samantha. Samantha? Hello, uh, I'm Samantha. Um, uh, uh, I will be reading um, uh, two of my essays from college, um, one on nationalization of healthcare and the other uh, on whistleblowing. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, for nationalization, um, uh, it goes, Susan Finley, a 53-year-old Walmart employee, was fired from her job due to having taken too much time off to recover from pneumonia. Due to this, she was incapable of paying for further medical care, and consequently, when she developed flu-like symptoms, she avoided the, to, uh, going to the doctor. She ended up being found dead in her home by her loved ones. Uh, Susan was only one example of many of how the American healthcare system has failed the people and continues to cause death and suffering when it's meant to provide the opposite. Today, the American people face exorbitant prices for healthcare, and tens of millions of Americans must go without adequate access to health insurance. The crisis must be resolved. The United States should pass legislation to nationalize the entire medical industry. The reason is that the private healthcare industry has led to unobtainable prices. Other nations that are by far much poorer than the US can provide free health care, uh, quality health care to all, and because it would lower costs for both civilians and the government. Uh, the, prices of the, uh, the prices of the private health care industry are so high that many people end up avoiding health care out of fear of going into medical debt. According to a HealthSpark survey of over 1,000 people, 44% of those surveyed said they avoided getting health care services because they were unsure of the uh, of the costs. And this is a reasonable response as the private medical industry artificially raises prices on essential medicines. This can cause people to face unnecessary suffering from a lack of life-saving medicines and needless financial devastation. Take, for example, insulin, with uh, which in other industrialized nations, a standardized unit that costs on average $9 would set Americans back $99. Over the past decade, insulin prices have risen by 54%. A medicine in which people will die without it has raised in price from an already unaffordable one to an even more exploitative and exorbitant price. It was only with pressure from the government that the price uh, was brought down to only $35 a month, which is still high and makes the corporations lots of profit, but at least now it's actually affordable. This shows that unless the government steps in, then private enterprises will seek to make important life-saving medicines entirely unaffordable for the sake of profit. Many opponents uh, to a nationalized healthcare system claim that it would be too costly for the U.S., the richest country on earth, to maintain such a system. If this, was, if this were the case, then poor countries with little access to resources would not be capable of running a nationalized system. But of course, this isn't the case. According to the New York State's Nurses Association, in every critical area of public health and medicine, 
Cuba has achieved undeniable success. These include creating a high quality primary care network and an unequaled public health system, educating a skilled workforce, sustaining a local biomedical research infrastructure, controlling infectious diseases, achieving a decline in non-communicable diseases, and meeting the emergency health needs of less developed countries. Cuba has been able to achieve all of this while also being faced with a massive embargo by the United States that makes it nearly impossible for Cuba to be able to trade with the world and obtain the medical resources they so desperately need. Nobody denies that healthcare in the U.S. for both the government and civilians is incredibly expensive. However, a model provided by the Lancet has shown that a single-payer system of universal healthcare would, in fact, reduce national healthcare expenditure by over 450 billion U.S. dollars. A system that would provide free services to all members of our society would greatly reduce the cost for the government. Furthermore, it should go without saying that not having to pay medical bills will greatly lower the health care price for civilians. In conclusion, health care is a human right that we all deserve without having to go into massive amounts of debt just to obtain. A nationalized system would most certainly benefit the masses by lowering prices and increasing availability. The U.S. Congress should pass legislation and nationalize the entire system and finally provide a quality free service to us all. We must go out there and push, i.e. protests, civil disobedience, etc., until we finally get those in power to enact the most crucial, uh, this most crucial bill. Every day, tens of millions of people go without the medical care that they so desperately need, and those who clamor on about the free market and how it uh, is apparently so crucial to the system only stand in the way of obtaining our human right to health care. Um, and then uh, uh, for the other one, right. uh, it's also uh, uh, for the other one, which is on whistleblowing, um, this one's also a short one. Um, uh, governments across the world uh, have been known to hide secrets from the general populace, most of the time for bad reasons. The role of the government is to work for its people, not to serve the interest of a small few. And so when we allow our governments to hide vital information, especially information that, if not leaked, could cause harm and suffering to innocent people, both domestically and abroad, then we allow for our governments to be ruled by that minority, the rich and the powerful bureaucrats. One of many ways that we can counter this imbalance is through whistleblowing. When someone with access to important and secret information deems said information vital for the general populace to know, whether that be because it violates rights, causes deaths, or anything between, and then publish that information, they are a whistleblower. There are many examples of this occurring within the U.S. alone, from WikiLeaks owner Julian Assange to former NSA worker Edward Snowden to the timeless classic of Rand Corporation employee Daniel Ellsberg. I will focus primarily on Ellsberg's bombshell leak of the Pentagon Papers in June 1971 to argue my points that upper-class individuals will use the system to do anything they can to preserve power, uh, that the media will play along with the government's games, and that the whistleblowing and that whistleblowing is a good and healthy practice for society. In a given class society, those in power will tend to do whatever it is necessary to main pa maintain power. As an example, using the case of the Pentagon Papers, we can observe the reaction toward the release of them by the Nixon administration. At first, when the New York Times began publishing the Pentagon Papers, Nixon's administration thought it could be used to gain political points by reminding readers uh, that the Vietnam War was the product of his predecessor's mistakes. However, the seeds of paranoia were planted when the Nixon administration came to the incorrect conclusion that the release of the study was timed to affect the upcoming McGovern-Hatfield Amendment vote, which would require the U.S. Uh, to withdraw uh, all forces from, the, from Vietnam. In response, Nixon would denounce the publication as treasonable before then cleaning house of disloyal people. With the further publication of the Pentagon Papers by the New York Times through the series on the matter, Ken Hughes would argue in his work, Chasing Shadows, the Nixon Tapes, the Chanel Affair, and the Origins of Watergate, that Nixon, uh, that Nixon would become worried that the leaks were disclosed of his, uh, would disclose of his secrets regarding Vietnam, specifically the undisclosed bombing of <clears throat> Cambodia and the Chanel Affair, Nixon's effort to forestall peace talks before the 1968 presidential election. Nixon eventually convinced himself that he was the target of a conspiracy involving uh, Johnson administration officials who had overseen the Pentagon Papers project. 
This would culminate in him giving out presidential orders to commit burglary, to find blackmail and other smearing evidence uh, against his opponents to maintain power. As we can see, Nixon's administration, though not directly targeted by the publications, became increasingly paranoid and afraid of the possibility of a plot to undermine his position. While this is only one example, there are many more like this throughout history and across the world. The general trend of media is to, for the most part, uncritically support the policies of the government. One of the exceptions to this rule is when scandals arise, typically brought on by the leaking of classified information by whistleblowers. When that occurs, the, uh, the media finally kicks into action and critically analyzes the policies of the government like journalists should be doing in the first place. Neil Sheehan uh, points this out spectacularly in his article, The Press and the Pentagon Papers in Naval War College Review. In there, he stated that when in discussion of American policy in Indochina before the release of the Pentagon Papers, we, the media, were questioned uh, the details of policy. Uh, the media did not question the substance. He would further go on to provide an example from his own experience. Or reporting in Vietnam between the years of 1962 to 1964, he would point out the failings of the Diem regime and uh, American policy within the region, but would fail to question whether Americans should be there in the first place. As he put it, we assume that the United States ought to be in Vietnam, attempting to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese. We assumed that we knew what was best for them. And we assumed that it was within our power to so mold Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese society. As we can see here, the media will typically act in a non-critical manner towards government policy most of the time. However, again, one of the ways this rule is broken is through the release of classified documents through whistleblowers. Whistleblowing is an important and healthy, for the most part, activity of a society. Without it, the bourgeois government could easily continue to commit horrible crimes without anyone being able to stop them. Daniel Ellsberg, the whistleblower of the Pentagon Papers itself, paints a decent picture of behind the scenes of the establishment and how they think of themselves and others. I was struck by President Johnson's reactions to the release of the Pentagon Papers as close to treason because it reflected to me the sense that we, uh, that what was damaging to the reputation of a particular administration, a particular individual, was in effect treason, which is very close to saying, I am the state. He would continue to say, but it must be painful for the American people now to read these papers and to discover that the men to whom they gave so much respect and trust, as well as power, regarded them as contemptuously as they regarded our Vietnamese allies. As painted here, the ruling class does as they please without regard for the consequences of their actions up until their crimes are revealed. As shown throughout this essay, whistleblowing is an important part of society. Without it, the government can easily get away with whatever they want. While the true answer to their issues lies in the discussion about the alternatives of systems to choose from, whistleblowing can aid in lessening the worst effects of the society. Um, yeah. Thank you, Samantha. Is this what well, you all can see me when I'm snapping? That's what the, that's what is. Thank you, Samantha. Are you still in college, Samantha? Uh, yeah, I'm currently going through uh, uh, my spring semester, um, uh, and this is still my freshman year, actually. What state? Uh, uh, in Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Texas, huh? Okay, I'll just I'll stop. Thank you, Samantha. All right, so um, okay, following Samantha, we'd like to hear from Al. My name is Al. Um, Al Markowitz. I'm been in, the, in this uh, organization for a while, but I'm also a, a publisher of a. My mission has been for the past 27 or more years to bring back proletarian literature because I realize how moving it is and how culture. Culture shapes our way of thinking, our way of seeing ourselves and everyone else in the world. It shapes everything. The right wing knows it, and they've been using it, you know, with false populism and all that. And we know where that goes, and I'm going to read about that. But we need to do it too, and we have. And uh, I'm going to do a session on it. But it was mostly repressed with the Red Scare of the 50s and all of that, you know. But it's more than time to bring it back. But in relation to you know, the things really never change except on the surface. You know, if, if you're living in a, in a capitalist society, 
we can win things. Massive people in the street got us social security. But, um, but it's like paddling upstream because they're always trying to take it back, right? You know, and, and so things change on the surface and they look good and we got symbolism, but it's empty. So I wrote this a while back when I was looking for work. And it says, in Charleston, the slave block, the slave block remains on display and tourists look on remembering those captive Africans standing afraid in the machine gun staccato of the auctioneers, uh, in the machine gun echo of the auctioneer staccato, remembering the natalie dressed buyer's inspection, eyelids pulled down and examined, the stretching of the mouth as teeth are checked, the prodding and padding, the invasive probe and half. Today, the slave blocks are smaller, ubiquitous, printed in rows on paper and on the internet. I try to stay in shape, keep my body in fluids clean and smile, showing my teeth, hoping for a kind and generous master. That's how it is with work, right? We're still slaves on the, on the shop floor. And my second piece is called The Wrong King. You know, we see him all the time, but something's wrong. It's, and I wrote this back when speak Bush was in bit, Al, Your voice is muted a little bit. Can you speak up a little bit, just a little louder? I'm not sure where the microphone is on this thing. Okay. It's the wrong king, the wrong president, an evil puppet swindled to power over the voice of the people. But this is different. The wrong king, not the Elvis impersonator on the beach, but much worse. The wrong king, that familiar face adorning January, eyes set wide on a promised land, seems an imposter, a pretender to the dream, a one dimensional doppelganger. Despite the preachers and politicians' shallow acknowledgments and the recognizable visits, this is not the king that called this country the number one purveyor of violence in the world. Or, the, or who called for a guaranteed annual income. Not the king that talked about the triple evils of racism, economic exploitation, and war, so popular but unmentionable in these times. No, the face looks right, but the message is all wrong. They're confusing with Martin, with Rodney. Can't we all get along? And lastly, I was told once that patriotism is a good thing. I'm just not a patriot. You know? So when I see the flags waving, I know death is sure to follow. The rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. I'm told patriotism is a good thing, love of country and all that. I see in my mind the old flickering images, ecstatic, proud Germans waving those little flags. It felt so good in those days, after shameful defeat in war and the weakness and corruption of Weimar, it felt so good to be proud again, to, ad to adore God and country, blood and soil, to be strong and united we stand, and patriotism is a good thing, and they hate us all anyway, so bomb them all and let God sort them out. We're back and we're proud. And never again. And we're number one. And all the and these colors don't run. So wave that flag with pride. But am I still talking about Germany? Or am I talking about Israel or Croatia? Or our own corporate empire where the misery pools like wealth and the burning world fuels our glory? Or does it matter? Does it matter if patriotism is still a good thing, if it kills, if it justifies murder, mass murder, if it prohibits asking even this? So wave that little flag harder, or better yet, put it down. Now is the time to stop fanning hatred, stop cheering murder, to dispossess the evil which threatens us all. 
to look in each other's eyes, to listen and hear our common human needs, our common hopes for the future, if there is to be one at all. Thank you, Al. Okay, we'd like to move uh, to DL. DL, remember to introduce yourself, DL. Thank you, Al. Hi, uh, I'm DL Lang. Uh, I'm a poet and I enjoy writing political poetry and the kind of political poems that I write serve to bear witness to history, to rally activists and kind of romanticize historical figures. And I'll be sharing a little bit of all of that. So this first poem, in honor of Black History Month, I'm going to do a poem I wrote for MLK. A preacher, a prophet, a king, standing up for the downtrodden, inspiring thousands to rise up in unity against hatred embedded systemically. His visionary life was cut short on the balcony of the Lorraine, but hatred can never extinguish his flame, for his words still ring true today. This king shall always reign among those who seek lasting change. It is up to you and me to bring forth a world free from war, hunger, racism, and poverty. We must carry on the legacy. We must believe deeply in the dream. We must choose the path of progress. We must march with our neighbors. We must all learn a better way. We must join together in song. We must plant the seeds of hope for better days in a world gone wrong. We must plant the seeds of justice. We must grow the fruits of peace. We must water the trees of equality. They shall blossom into an era where every human is finally free. One day it shall no longer be a dream. These, thank you. These uh, next two poems I wrote for the anthology called A Working Man's Hand, and I premiered it at the uh, Woody Guthrie Folk Festival in Okima, Oklahoma. It's called No Greater Love. Working folks trudge and toil until we're all used up, discarded before our prime, never reaping the spoils inside the rich man's cup. But if workers ran the world, we wouldn't have to worry, for all of life would spark our glory. If working folks ran the world, we'd pay people above their worth, no matter the job, large or small, so every human could stand tall. If working folks ran the world, we'd have more time to enjoy all the people that we adore instead of missing out more. If working folks ran the world, it would cease to run on greed. Life wouldn't be about what got sold. Everyone would have exactly what they need. The world would turn on love, not gold. If working folks ran the world, we'd make sure our neighbors, every one, were properly housed with enough food for every mouth. No one would ever again go without. If working folks ran the world, it'd be one big union of humanity filled with love for you and me, for there is no greater love than our eternal solidarity. That was beautiful. Thank you. This one is called Together We Will Rise. From the indigenous workers robbed of their land to the black workers forced to pick and build this land, to the Latino migrants kept from traveling this land, to the Chinese workers who built our railroads, to the Japanese workers unfairly interned, to the Arab workers falsely accused of violence, to the Jewish workers who escaped fascist hands, to the Irish workers who fled a divided homeland, to the queer workers forced to hide who they love, to the trans workers forced to hide their true souls, to the women workers forced to labor in their homes, to the children who work for low wages in sweatshops, to the working poor forced to live in outright squalor, to the homeless people who must beg for a dollar, to the disabled workers who are grossly underpaid, to the incarcerated workers seeking mercy and freedom, to the brave union workers who died in labor struggles, to the workers injured by war, police, and the draft. We have so much in common with one another. One day we'll unite to take what's back take back what's rightfully ours from those who exploited, bombed, and divided the people. For centuries now, the rich have created a great evil. When we get together, there's no stopping what's in store. On that great day, all of us will settle the score, flipping this world together for justice and peace once more. Yes, bravo. <laughs> <Yeah>. That's <laughs> our, our cheerleader. 
beautiful DL. <laughs> Thank you. And and let me uh, invite all of you to send us uh, if your work, if we can publish your work, please send it to us uh, because we have uh, a few little avenues that we can utilize. But beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So next we'd like to have um, David Trujillo. Can you uh, make your contribution now? I sure will. And I apologize for being on the phone. I just couldn't get into the uh, the the, uh, the systems uh, on my computer. But uh, I'm a uh, uh, I'm a, a playwright and a writer. Uh, and a journalist. I've done some articles for the uh, People's World, and I'm a uh, a long-time labor community activist, and I live in Los Angeles, and I'm still writing. Um, I'm going to read a a new unpublished poem that I just finished. Uh, this is going to be the first time it's been heard publicly, uh, and it's called Traitors of Democracy. A perverted sense of morality, traitors of democracy, and a renewed interest in the lost cause. Nervously preaching, for it is a lie. It's the glorification of the Confederacy. Like snakes in the grassland, cold-blooded vipers beware, traitors of democracy. Hate speeches, hissing sounds, and vicious nature. They are serpents of deception. Predators live insecure lives with Nazi symbols. A snake slithers away while hiding behind the Confederate flag. These traitors of democracy willfully wave the American flag with fascist intent. Dishonesty breeds false beliefs. Don't tread on me. We don't like democ diversity. Naive apologists for collaborators and the January 6th insurrection in Washington, D.C. They want us to forget. Snakes don't commit suicide. Perverting history to their liking, the South will rise again. The code language is no surprise. Their leaders, their leader can do no wrong, says the haters. America, America. He divides America by race. They want us to believe in the supreme propaganda, make America great again. They preach, it's the fear of losing control, the glorification of the lost cause, vipers of deception, desperately wanting to believe, individuals exercising their free speech, and people demanding their rights. Not so, not so collaborators against democracy uh, that's uh, uh i just like i said i just uh i just finished that uh, uh, uh poem uh, uh about a week ago uh been writing it for uh, a couple Thank months you. now and uh um so what i want to do now is um uh we all know that uh, uh in certain communities, particularly the black and brown communities, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, police brutality. Uh, and, and let me just state that I, I'm a, I'm not a career writer. I, I, I'm working working class writer, uh, and uh, you know I write uh, with a lot of uh, impulse and, and emotion and uh, and themes that are are, are currently uh, affecting our, our our people in our communities. Um, I wrote this one, and it's called uh, The Pine Overcoat. Real trauma in the streets, a burden upon the block. Red lights, sirens blasting, gunshots explode as if no one cares. Shameless blame with unidentified, unintentional mistakes. Impractical justification a community on the edge. Witness, witness to torture, hot winds create hot heat. It's always been that way. Cuff and stuff or hook and book, death in a pine overcoat. I've told you so, 
I've seen it. Violence every day, history repeated, history made, a trail of tears, deportation here, century old forgiveness, praying for the victims, fixing nothing, a soothing fix. Short tempers diffused by a constitutional honest review. Really, this time, really, it's a fix. Um, that's, of course, the, uh, the pine coat is the, uh, the pine overcoat is the, uh, is the, is the, is the coffin, right? Of course. And then, um, this was, uh, about the, uh, the homelessness, uh, in America. And it's called the underbelly of America. Under a concrete bridge lies an independent space. Worried, worry, broken, broke, women abused, overused men, lost lives, chasing shadows. Challenging stories, a challenging life. Homeless camps here and there, infested makeshift shelters. Overcrowded sidewalk nest. Living symbols of institutional failure, immersed wealth against homeless mayhem, suppressing motivation, innovation, and personal growth, unnoticed, unheard, just a glance away, the concrete roof of a freeway underpass, too much grief and tension, too much stress, too much American nonsense the underbelly of America. Um, and those are the examples of some of my writings. So some of them have been published. Uh, I just published a book, uh, just came out. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna be having a public uh, community reading this afternoon. Uh, I've been publishing an anthology. Like I said, I'm a playwright and I do have a play that's supposed to be coming out uh, I'm producing it, and uh, we're looking at uh, the play coming out in in uh, August or summer. Uh, I've done uh, several plays here in Los Angeles uh, and Chicago, and I'm looking forward to bringing out my uh, my latest play. Thank you, David. And again, if you have anything, especially the one you just wrote or anything else that we can publish, please send it to us. Thank you, David. And let me say, let me invite uh, especially the poets back again, April 20th. April 20th, there will be a session dedicated to poetry especially. So please feel encouraged to join us again, April 20th. So thank you, David. And now we will, we'd like to uh, pass the mic to uh, David Hill. Thank you, Dee, and uh, it's really a privilege to be with here, here with all of you, and uh, I've so enjoyed hearing your writing. Uh, I'm David Hill. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, um, and I'm part of uh, the within our uh, Anna Haas Morgan Club in Columbus, Ohio. We have a writers' collective. Uh, I don't have any formal training in writing, and through the writers' collective, they taught me how to do working class journalism. And so I wanted to share a piece that I wrote for People's World last year uh, with some encouragement from my, my comrades in Columbus, as well as uh, John and CJ at People's World. They uh, encouraged me to drive up to Toledo uh, when the UAW strike was announced and to meet with the, uh, the strikers there and kind of cover their, their struggle. So I'm going to read this article here. You can find it on uh, People's World. Uh, so workers at the Toledo Assembly Complex are on the picket line and helping to spearhead the struggle against the corporate leadership of the big three automakers. The complex, run by Stellantis, is one of three plants the union selected to strike first. The other two are the GM facility in Wentzville, Missouri, and a Ford final assembly plant in Wayne County, Michigan. The workers here remain solid in their determination to stand up for respect on the job and fair treatment with substantial wage hikes and other gains that make up for their past sacrifices to keep the big three auto companies afloat. It's obscene, they say, that CEOs making many millions of dollars in compensation off of their labor claim that they can't afford to meet their more than fair demands. 
The sense of intimate family ties was palpable up and down the picket line on Saturday morning, the second day of the strike announced by UAW President Sean Fain at 12 a.m. on Friday, September 15. The Toledo assembly plant was chosen as one of the first sites to strike as part of the UAW stand up strike strategy. The facility here includes the original 1941 Jeep factory and produces the hugely popular Jeep Wrangler and Jeep Gladiator vehicles, accounting for as much as 40% of production under the Jeep brand. We build this brand, Brandon Vasquez, team leader and strike captain for the Wrangler right door assembly crew told me. Each entrance gate to the Toledo assembly complex was covered by a picket line composed of members of an assembly line team. The team that builds together strikes together with team leaders from inside the factory taking on the roles of strike captains for the picket line. Walking up to each gate felt like walking into a family reunion. Laughter, food, and music rising from packs of red UAW t-shirts and signs. Workers at the plant have ample opportunities to form the close-knit bonds that they are relying on now. They work six days each week, 10 hours per day. Most also work one Sunday per month. It seems like we see each other more than we see our own families, said left side door team leader Chris Dennis. Both Dennis and his co-worker Dominic West turned out for their shift on Saturday morning, this time on the picket line instead of the assembly line. West and Dennis have worked together for nearly 10 years. Both come from families with a long history at the Toledo Assembly Complex and the UAW. West has aunts and uncles, as well as a grandparent who all worked at the plant. Dennis started the job through a referral from his dad who worked for Jeep for many years. In that time, Dennis and West have seen their pace of work increase dramatically while wages stagnated and jobs were cut back. Workers on the left door line processed 210 cars in a single shift. In the past, left door assembly was completed in two minutes and 30 seconds. Recently, jobs were cut on the line, along with the time allowed for each assembly cycle. Workers are now expected to complete the exact same assembly process in one minute and 40 seconds, over and over again, 210 times per day, six days per week, week after week after week. Yet these workers won't be denied their fair share. We can't even afford to buy the cars we produce. Well, the CEOs take everything they can get away with, said Dennis, while holding a sign that read, and the two-tier system, referring to the system introduced after the 2009 government restructuring of the big three that lowered wages for newly hired auto workers. As he was speaking with People's World, the stereo behind him blasted out the chorus of Ozzy Osbourne's 1991 hit, No More Tears. Thrilling cheers and laughter filled the air and everyone shared a round of fist bumps and high fives. Further down the line, Brandon Vasquez led the right door assembly team for their shift on the picket line. Vasquez is another 10 year veteran at the plant, referred to the job by his father, Robert, who works in quality control. The support from the community has been unreal. We got 18 cases of water just this morning and we were being fed all day by people stopping by. Vasquez's team has a tradition of pooling money to buy donuts from nearby Don's Donuts for the whole crew every Friday morning. After hearing about the strike, Don himself stopped by with free donuts for the whole crew this week. Community support was undeniable. A nonstop barrage of horn honks from passing drivers accompanied nearly every moment of the picket. Fire trucks, a garbage crew, and even a city street sweeper all made detours to drive past the main gates of the assembly plant to show their support. At one point, a crew of at least a dozen Polaris slingshots, the low riding, three wheeled open top sports cars rolled past the picket line in formation music bumping and horns honking. This was the first strike for Darren, a member of Vasquez's right door assembly team who started the job just a few months ago. As a trainee, Darren reports to work early at 5.30 a.m. every day. He's expected to learn a wide variety of assembly positions while maintaining the same pace of work as everyone else and a relentless six day work week. Only he does it all for the entry level wage. Out of the 15 other new hires who started at the same time as Darren, only five now remain at the plant due to the demanding pace of work and low wages. The strike is the only way I can get a pay raise anytime soon, Darren reflected. The consensus among the right door assembly team was that Ab Abigail Archibek bested all of her colleagues in both Jeep pedigree and skill. A third generation Jeep employee, Abigail uh, was joined in the picket line by her mother, Tracy, who works at the plant, and her grandmother, Mary, who retired from the Toledo Assembly Complex. Abigail has spent the last four and a half years under the temporary worker status, which requires her to float between any open position anywhere on the assembly line on demand. 
She has to meet the same timing standards as anyone else while earning the lowest wages paid by the company. She maintains the same six day, 10 hour day schedule as any other worker, but must also be available to take on extra shifts on her day off if necessary or risk losing her job. She often passes an entire month without a day off work. Nevertheless, the right door assembly team agreed that Abigail was probably the only person among them who could assemble an entire Jeep Wrangler on her own. And that's because she's done every job on the assembly line. And I'll skip ahead here. A sense of family and community built through hard daily work binds this union together. They know what they're fighting for. If I had a 32 hour work week, I could spend more time with my daughter and my wife and live a little bit instead of working all the time. Chris Dennis said, told me from the left door assembly line. Robert Vasquez told People's World, before I retire, I wanna make sure my son and all the other workers have a chance to live a decent life. That's why I'm out here. They know that workers all across the country are watching to see what happens with the UAW. Walking out from the picket line after spending the morning with the striking workers, Stephanie, a veteran of the right door assembly team with a young daughter at home approached me. Can I ask you a question, she said. What do you think will happen with the strike? I think the unity on display in Toledo bodes well for the workers. El Pueblo Unido Hamas Aravencido. The people united will never be defeated. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. And uh, we promise to read your material in the people's world if you promise to continue to read it for us here. <laughs> it's a deal. Okay, thank you. All right, Joe, do you want to go next or can you hold on? Joe's not feeling well. He's agreed to join us this morning. Whatever uh, you do, best day. Uh, well, you sound terrible, so go, go let let's let let's hear. From, okay, I didn't need to say that. Sorry. Uh, 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 so go go next, Joe. Thank you. Okay. Good. <clears throat> good morning, everybody, and and happy Black History Month. I'm Joe Sims. I live in New York City. I work for the National Committee of the Communist Party. Um, I want to share with you this morning a uh, piece I wrote some years ago. Uh, it is a um, true story, uh, a Thanksgiving day or around Thanksgiving, I don't remember which encounter. And it goes like this. Uh, the Stavage Bike Trail extends for 10 miles on the Mahoning River, just south and a little east of Youngstown, Ohio, past the giant ruins of Republic Steel and Youngstown Sheet and Tube, and alongside a railroad track that connects the post-industrial towns of Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania. The trail, is a bike enthusiast dream. An almost level terrain, say one or two inclines and combined shade and sun and solitude. It is isolated, yet connected, rural, but just minutes away from the urban slums scattered throughout the once proletarian landscape. Alongside the rusted out valley, Fast moving railroad trains keep company with the slow drift of the river. Whirls and rabbits compete with butterflies, tracing themselves back and forth in the wind. On the other side of the railroad track, a chew mail pouch tobacco billboard backs a barnyard like structure across a town square and the city's courthouse. About four miles down the trail, a rustle in the trees reveals a brown flurry in flight, a five to six foot wingspan sailing across the path and into the forest. Following in its wake, another hawk soars noiselessly in pursuit, twinning its partner's movements, dancing through the trees. The sun comes out from behind a cloud 
a small yellow butterfly skirts the path, a train whistles somewhere down the tracks, and then a turn in the road. Suddenly there's a hint of darkness. As the sun lost its race with the clouds, I look up reassured, but then to the left along the path, black bushes decorated with an even darker fruit, and in the distance, pools of stagnant, algae-filled water from which rise the rotted trunks of trees, like so many fingers grasping. Look down upon the winding path, reveals it. First, a star circumscribed with a circle, and in each three triangle, the number six, and a second later, three hooded figures, and under them the letters KKK, and chalked in white beneath, clan rises again. For a moment, the breath catches in the throat, and even in movement, the world stands silent and still. And then through the screaming silence, a sudden screech and the hawks rise away and into the trees. I titled that The Hawk and the Klansman. And that's mm -hmm. what I do uh, this Black History Month morning. Thanks, D. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Uh, and I guess I should say that Joe is the uh, one of the chairs of the party, and um, I don't think he did say that. Uh, so he is. Thank you. And with all of that he has to deal with, he was uh, coerced into joining us this morning. Thank you, Joe. All right. Uh, so let's move to uh, Candace. Candace? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, comrades. Uh, apologies that I, I don't have the, uh, the video aspect uh, working. I'll work on that for next time. So my name is Candace Wolf. Uh, I'm a storyteller and oral historian. And my work as an oral historian includes a collection of working class oral history interviews that I gathered in the US and internationally. The collection is called Shifting the Universe, Spoken Histories of Work and Resistance. Due to the limited time I have today, I'm going to share just the concluding words from one or two of these oral histories. Let me begin with Rosa Ayala, a janitor involved in the Los Angeles Justice for Janitors campaign in the 1980s and 1990s. Here is Rosa speaking. We demand our rights while standing on our feet, and we will die on our feet, never, never on our knees. There is always a struggle, a war, between the rich and the poor. The rich don't want the poor to become a strong force, but more and more, the people will become aware of what the rich do to enrich themselves. And that is the day when the rich will be defeated. We say, pay attention. They are the millionaires, but we are the millions. Isn't it true that it is we workers who produce the wealth? It is we, the workers, who plant and harvest the crops and bring the best dishes of food to the tables of the rich. Others clean their houses and their office buildings. Others take care of their children. Others run to clean their buttocks when they are sick. Well, I have to work or I'll be out on the street. I still work as a janitor in the U.S. Bank at 633 Quinta Avenue and Figueroa. It is the tallest building in Los Angeles. I work from 5.30 in the evening until 2 a.m. The floors where I work are where you find the entrance to the CEO's office and the investor's office and the lawyer's office. Lawyers and lawyers and more lawyers who have very big cases. And I have the key to enter those offices. 
these are the offices of powerful people. And me, I only throw out that trash. But I throw it out with pride and dignity. Because without us janitors, those executive suites would be a total mess. If only, if only there was a worldwide workers movement, that would be so beautiful. We would fight to end poverty, both material poverty and poverty of the spirit. Because a person can be rich with material things, but very poor in everything else. On the other hand, you may be poor in material things, but you can still have a rich, loud voice to get your message across. You can be loud, and they are going to criticize you for being loud, but at least you you will be heard. I am sure that if a day ever comes when they don't pay attention to me, when they don't even notice that I exist, the day when they don't speak of me without a kind word, Oh, cruel one. That is the day that I am going to die. But the struggle is life giving. I only completed first grade, but I have three diplomas in the experiences of exploitation, humiliation, and discrimination. And I have another degree in the struggle for justice. There is no better university than life itself. Am I right? Yes or no. And I now will share the words of the oral history of Mike Filippo. Again, this is just a concluding word of his oral history testimonial. Uh, Mike was a worker and a shop steward at the Stella de Oro Cookie Factory in the Bronx, New York. I interviewed Mike following an 11 month strike against the Brynwood Corporation. And here he is speaking about the day that the judge at the labor board found the company guilty of negotiating in bad faith and ordered Brynwood to take the workers back with a full contract. Oh, my God. Forget about it. There was a big, huge celebration that day. We took over the whole Broadway, and we were shouting with happiness, and the people in their cars were honking at us, and the people in the buses and trains were cheering for us because we had been on the picket line for 11 months. Everybody saw us there every single day. But as soon as we felt the satisfaction of returning to work, Brynwood told us they were going to close. I think that they wanted to use us as an example of how they could break a worker's resistance. So I started talking to people about making plans to take over the plan. I mean, this is our plan. The state gave the company our taxpayer money to buy machinery and robots that took our job. Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, when he came to New York to talk to the United Nations, we had a chance to talk to him about the Stella de Oro struggle. And that night at the United Nations, he talked about the workers and a factory in the Bronx who lost their job. And later we met with the vice president of the Venezuelan petroleum company, Sitpo, and we explained to him from A to Z about the strike and the Stella de Oro Bakery. A week and a half later, he called me and said, we have the okay to buy the Stella de Oro factory and turn it over to the workers to run themselves without the bosses. But Brynwood will not respond to our offer. How do I think the workers would run the factory differently than the bosses? First of all, we would create a committee to make decisions with input from all the workers. It would be a factory run by everybody as equal people. Everybody would have the same right and everybody would have the same responsibility. The working conditions would be much, much better because we would be working for ourselves. We would make sure the workplace was safe and clean and healthy. We would make sure the workers had enough break. We wouldn't lay off workers and pile so much extra production on the workers who are left 
because we don't care about profit and money like the bosses. We care about the people who do the work. For instance, I had a lunch break all figured out. Under the bosses, we were always rushing around at lunchtime. We had to rush to eat a sandwich. We had to rush to the bathroom. We had to rush outside to get a breath of fresh air or maybe smoke a cigarette or walk around a factory. But if the workers ran the factory, the lunchtime would be one and a half or two hours long. We would stop production and we would take turns cooking a wonderful and satisfying lunch for everybody right there at the factory. Then we would sit around the table and share the meal as equal people. Fresh food made right there by co-workers. We would joke around and have discussions and enjoy our meal together. And then we would go back to work happy. See, we don't need the bosses. We don't need no bosses to squeeze us just to make a profit. What does the boss do? He just uses you and makes a lot of profit from you. We make the pro product, not the boss. We know how to mix the dough. We know how to put the ingredients together. We know how to bake it. We know how to pack it. The boss just sits in his office and waits for us to make it for him. Let's say you make bread. The boss isn't going to roll up his sleeves and make the dough. The workers are going to make it. We have the experience and the skill. If people realize how much power they have and what kind of skills we have as workers, we wouldn't have no bosses. It's a big, big thing, actually, for people to realize that they don't need the boss. Did you know that in Argentina, there are workers who run their own factories? They make very good products. And they make a good living and they support their family. It's amazing what the people can do without the bosses. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Thank you. Thank you. And no problem. No. Okay. I have three more presenters. Karamo, can you go next? Thank you. Forgive me. Uh, when it first came on, uh, I couldn't even find my. My control panel was uh, somewhere near my uh, trash, and it looked like it was going into it. These are the the, uh, the the things that happen in modern technology these days. This is just sort of uh, the, on the road to becoming more tech savvy. Yeah, um, language is something else. You're communicating very well, so please proceed. Okay, you got. I've got four poems, um, and I'm going to read. Um, and the first is entitled, You See Homes. Despite what Bishop Barber says, what do you do when you have to move? Have you ever experienced the pain of an eviction? Colleges, universities, and corporations have more rights than individuals. Is it because they are bigger people? Faith. The family lawyer is hardly a match for the general counsel or his or her corporate staff. They say they have vouchers now. The predominantly African-American housing community can now go someplace else. You have never seen pain until you have been there. You should have seen the look on their faces of the people, homelessness of a different kind. Your kind is not good enough to sit around a university. Quality shops and schools are not for them. But we search deeper for change of attitude in the United States of America, a place to live, Equality for all shall be the goal of humanity. And biological faith. Karamo, can we leave it there? There's an interruption and uh, we can't seem to uh, 
to quiet uh, a person. So can we leave it there, Karamo, and move on to the next person? We're a little bit over time. Karamo, April 20th. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Molly? Okay. So um, this poem, um, I, I have two short poems. Um, my name is Molly, I'm in Cleveland, I'm an organizer with the party. And um, this one is called, We Wear Our Pain Well, It's, ta it's Tailor Made. And uh, that's in reference to a, a local hip hop group named uh, Muamin Collective. Protect your heart through moral action. Through moral action, protect your heart. And even the most righteous among us will lose their love one day. It's an ongoing practice. Can you accept this as if it were going to be true for the rest of your life? Can you sit in the mud of it, the valley of it, the fact of it? Can you stop and accept the beauty and wonder of struggle? As you move forward, can you be still to let it rain from you, to let it sing out in harmonics of human potential? If you don't want to, so long. One day we will carry you when we're strong enough many enough. For now, the call is an invitation to grow, to go, not a demand, a welcoming, like a hand open again and again. We are not 24 seven, but we could be. Will you come along to become? Will you come along to become? Not one of us is spared the beckoning of light to bloom. And this next poem um, is called, This Genocide. And this is based in the current struggle in Cleveland to get a ceasefire resolution passed in Cleveland City Council. Um, and so some of the responses that I'm making here are directly to statements made by city council members. This genocide, they want it all to get simpler now on the backs of unmembering on the backs of brown children whose dreams are entwined with mine. Jewish safety is Palestinian safety. This genocide, did you follow the line of starvation and thirst amid bombing, failing, tent city in the downpour, broken grief coping? Did you hear the sound of South Africa harmonizing with your spine? Because if not, we've got the replay. We rock back and forth, keeping pace with our fears. Do you feel the earth's trauma, swirling, dizzy, a broken record with a new face, a child's round eyes who know nothing of what went down before? This genocide, do you recognize, do you organize, or do you cower from controversy? Do you require both sides as if one photo doesn't tell the whole story? Do you answer to money or to a better world beyond retribution and suffering spread out? It starts with honesty. It stands on love. This genocide, will you cry out publicly for the world to see or will you wait for the next one? the next world maybe maybe you believe yourself so close to the white man with property to the billionaire with an army that you're like some type of god who can overcome the system in crisis and the people you've turned your back on or maybe you will choose to build unity to refuse to sacrifice any of us for some to draw from your stone and pick from your tree to help make a new memory, one that will end this genocide. We must end this genocide. And the main difference between a dream like this and a memory is whether or not we woke up. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Again, uh, if we can publish your materials, uh, please feel compelled to send it to us. Now, our last presenter, hopefully we can get this uh, working, is Bob. Bob, let me see you open your mic. 
and Bob has been working for hours trying to get connected. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, how's everybody doing? Thanks for inviting me, by the way. Um, I, the last few poems, I heard great poems. Um, uh, um, um, I love Karamo's work, by the way. Uh, and the sister that was just spitting, beautiful, man. I loved your poem, actually. I have one that will complement that after this one. Okay, okay Bob, we, we're running out of time, so please. Uh... Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. The so Gathering of Dust. This poem is called The Gathering of Dust. Sometimes when the wind blows, dust flies into the eyes. The thing is that when these grains of dust gather, they form dirt. Then between all of that and the moisture, it dirties our clothes and sinks deep into the skin, which gives us the reason to shower and wash our hands down the drain and into the sewer. They all join into the same river. When the wind blows and the dust forms and when the rain comes, it forms a mudslide of appetite for everyone in it in its path from statue monuments to forest terrain to monumental buildings, its mouth opens and it sucks up the lake and it grows much greater and its hunger swallows cars, trucks, tractor trailers, trains and railroads its way into the shattering of highways, sucking in the skyline while being cheered on and manipulated by the gust of wind. When the dust gathers and the rain falls and the wind blows and the shingles fall off rooftops, tenements turn into waterfalls, the trees fall, the trees fall, entire entire towns are floating on an ocean. When the dust gathers and the storm comes and the mountains obey, the wave of sinking pavements moves moves in command like loose wheeled shopping carts at a grocery store, sliding drawers and freezers gliding down the aisles and all the items roll off the tumbling shelves, sparks by sparks fly from the ceiling lights, afternoon turns into night, but the sun brings back the day. Calm touches the lake, the ocean stands still, the mountain stands like a gentle giant. When the dust forms, it holds the roots in check, protects and feeds the seeds. The flowers blossom. The, the trees have grown. The dust have gathered into motar to build roads, buildings, and highways. From the very beginning, God said, let there be lights. But you are a landslide, a tsunami with the strength and ability to move an entire world because on the sixth day, God made you out of dust. And my next one, cry of democracy. Democracy doesn't knock on your front door. On your front lawn, matter of fact, it has an inmate number of zero, zero, one. She was violated in front of her children, in front of her husband. She speaks the language of help. The explosion in her voice mourns the echo of a dying village. Riding her body, pillowed in shade limbs, blood paints her town red. Democracy abandoned her freedom like the last metro up north left her. De deadbeat, fatherless, unfamily, the familiar to displaced babies, wounded knee, refugees in cages, holocaust in gas chambers, the stench of cooking flesh. The leaders has her husband's body to the neck, buried in asphalt, then stoned what was left of it, brain mashed, potatoed in mud, part of his skull was found in a fruit. Have you ever bitten an apple with a bone in it? Pain blinks despair of a two-year-old child face Emmett Till. Democracy doesn't knock on your front door, on your front lawn. Have you ever saw a mother crying, carrying her purple-skinned baby flesh torn to the white meat? The horror in her scream has no sound. Her face is a nightmare. There is no bridge to wake up. The realities are rubbles at her front step, now a tombstone. The street is a cemetery. Michael Rappaport stands on stage, neo nazi in his speech, seems to be what privilege looks like. Hate speech dressed in whistle, blow horn, hailed in gaslit literature, departure of human rights, 
justice rest in body pieces, jigsaw puzzled, unrecognizable, vilified torsos, democracy doesn't knock on your front door, made a phone call or visited your front lawn when there is no home to come to. That's it. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for making the effort to join us. Uh, and it took him hours this morning. He was working on it. We appreciate the effort. It uh, you came through. But in, in conclusion, thank all of you. Beautiful work, beautiful effort. We want to uh, continue. Our next session is March 16th, uh, and it will include a skill building uh, a component as well as a continuation of authors reading. So thank you. It's, it's just a joy. It's just a joy. Working class art, is a part of the joy of struggle. And we want to create the platform where, you, where we can uh, share our uh, talents. So thank you. And thank you everyone for staying over uh, a little bit this morning. Karamo, we will make it up to you. Please indulge us. Thank you and have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Yes, indeed. <laughs> have a Thank good, you. have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Peace.